The last Jewish victim of the Nazis was killed on the 13th of May, 1945. You heard the date correctly. I haven't made a mistake. No slip of the tongue here. It was the 13th of May, 1945. By then, Hitler had been dead for two weeks and the war had been over for several days, but the killing continued. In this video, I shall explain how this happened. Rainer Beck was born on the 16th of October 1916 in Gliwice, then Gliwice in Upper Silesia. His father was chief of police and a member of the progressive SPD. He lost his job following the law to restore the professional civil service. This law prevented Jews and members of the Communist Party from working for the state. President Paul von Hindenburg objected and, as a result, war veterans, those who had lost a father or a son in the war, and those who had been employed since the 1st of August 1914 were excluded. In practice, this meant that almost all Jews could stay in their jobs until Hindenburg's death in 1934, when the law was applied to them too. During World War I, Rainer Beck's father had served at the front. After losing his job, he wrote a letter to Hermann Goering, saying that he would support his family by busking in the streets with a violin, wearing his uniform and medals. As a result, a pension of almost 300 marks per month was granted. Whether or not this is because of the threat to Goering, or because of the Polish-German agreement on Upper Silesia, which protected minorities, is debatable. However, this treaty ran out in May 1937, and when he died in 1938, the pension was cancelled, as his widow, Elsa, was Jewish. Rainer was expelled from grammar school as a half-Jew at the age of 16. His sister, Fredegund, was forced out of the university, and his other sister, Bertilde, was no longer permitted to work as a midwife. In 1936, Rainer Beck went to sea. He found work on a whaler in Canada as a harpooner. When his father died in 1938, he returned to Germany to look after his mother. He was hired on a fishing boat which was incorporated into the armed forces together with its crew in 1940. Meanwhile, whilst he was fighting for his country, his mother was facing the wrath of the Nazis in Gleiwitz, the block elder not permitting her to use the air raid shelter, for example, and generally making life difficult for her. On his home leave in Gleiwitz, Beck made a point of wearing his uniform, which he felt may have given some protection to his family. Although, as he half-joked to his sister at the time, it was the uniform of the people who wanted to destroy him and his family. In September 1944, Beck was with the Aimude Harbour Protection Group. Aimude is on the North Sea and is linked to Amsterdam via canal. On the 5th of September 1944, Beck received orders to return to Germany. By this time, he had lost contact with his mother. Fearing that in the Reich itself he may become a victim of the Holocaust, he deserted. His sister Fredegund was living in Amsterdam and he joined her for a few days. Later, he was aided by Dutch resistance fighters who took him to a house on Bocellistraat where a German Jew named Hans Marcus was already living in hiding. Together with Marcus, Beck survived in an attic until liberation. On the 5th of May 1945, all German armed forces in the Netherlands surrendered. Two days later, Amsterdam was liberated by Canadian troops. There were almost 3,000 POW German sailors in Amsterdam. 
as from the 11th of May 1945, they were accommodated in a former Ford factory at Hembroek near Amsterdam. The Canadians appointed the former German port commander, Frigate Captain Alexander Stein, as camp commandant. He was subordinate to the Canadian Major Pierce, whose superior in turn was Major Mace. The Amsterdam branch of the Admiral's Court in the Netherlands was moved to this camp at the same time. Obviously, the former sailors no longer had their weapons, but officers kept their pistols because, according to Canada's view, the Germans in Hembroek were not prisoners of war, but disarmed enemy forces. The German officers were also given full command and disciplinary power. After the German surrender, Beck turned himself over to the Canadian troops. They initially placed him in a makeshift camp with SS and SD inmates. Beck complained and was released and allowed to return to his sister before going on to a camp for sailors. Somewhere he met a 20-year-old Austrian called Dörfer who was in a similar situation. Dörfer was the son of a Styrian master roofer who had volunteered for the Navy in 1943, but who had deserted from his unit, the 9th Boat Flotilla, towards the end of the war. His aunt, Joanna Timmermans, in Amsterdam, took him in and gave him civilian clothes. At his sister's home, Beck packed a pair of socks, gave her his watch and walked out. Both he and Dörfer thus walked into a trap. In 1966, his sister Fredegund commented to the German magazine Der Spiegel. God knows why he did it. The relatives of the two learned later that Beck and Dörfer had been sent to a camp. Then their trail was lost. In the camp at Hembrook, they were placed under the command of the German camp commandant. The camp commandant was Alexander Stein, born in 1891 and former flotilla commander. He asked the two to be removed as they wanted nothing to do with them as deserters. The Canadians refused. However, a Canadian general suggested a court-martial. Thus, they were both arrested for desertion. That same evening, Camp Commandant Alexander Stein, after consultation with the naval judges Kern and Bechtel, decided to court-martial Beck and Dörfer. Major Pierce, as well as the Superior German Military Justice Authority, were informed of their intentions and permission was requested to proceed. Permission was granted by both the German military authorities and the Canadians. The next morning, the German court-martial was chaired by Naval Chief Justice Wilhelm Kern, born 1909. The prosecutor was Naval Chief Justice Bechtel. Defence lawyers were assigned for the defendants so that a court-martial could be uh, performed based on the German War Penal Procedure Code of the 17th of August 1938. According to the Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force Law No. 153 of the 4th of May 1945, all German courts martial, with the exception of field court martials, were abolished. So there's a clear legal question of why this was allowed to proceed. Kern claimed later that he was unaware of this law which abolished court martials. In addition to around 3,800 camp inmates who watched the proceedings, a supervisory judge of the court of the German Admiral in the Netherlands and the Canadian and German camp commanders and their translators took part in the hearing. The trial was held in a factory hall. It lasted less than two hours. Beck and Dörfer had the opportunity to comment on the indictment. 
Kern said in 1966 that Beck said nothing, perhaps not realising the mortal peril he was in. After about five minutes of deliberation, Chairman Kern announced the verdict, death by shooting for desertion. Years later, Kern defended his judgment by saying that for disciplinary reasons it was absolutely necessary. The two death sentence should then have been properly confirmed by the highest German judge, the Admiral in the Netherlands, Vice Admiral Rudolf Stanger, who was in the UK at the time. Only the Camp Commandant Stein signed the confirmation that very afternoon. Stein believed then that he was entitled to do so under the War Penal Procedure Code. The then Admiral Stanger, on the other hand, considered this to be impossible. He certainly had no authority to confirm death sentences, he said 21 years later. The Canadian Ministry of Defence confirmed in 1966 to Der Spiegel that on the 13th of May 1945, some German naval deserters were brought before a German court-martial and sentenced to death by shooting. According to the ministry's records, the German troops interned in West Holland had been left with disciplinary powers, including the right to execute deserters. A German firing squad under the command of German Lieutenant John Ossenbrücken was equipped with rifles and ammunition from German stocks held by the Canadians. The Canadians provided the transport, The prisoners were taken to the Sehelingvode shooting range near Amsterdam. At 17.40, Dörfer was shot dead. Five minutes later, Beck was also killed. They were buried nearby. In theory, the high command of the German Navy in Meyerwick could confirm death sentences in northern Germany and Norway until the 15th of May 1945. On that day, death sentences, corporal punishment and the use of German weapons were prohibited on a basis of a decree by the British occupying forces. As far as this execution was concerned, according to Kern, everything was initiated by the Canadian commander. The Canadians organised everything and also determined the place of execution. The relatives of Rainer Beck were informed by the German office for the notification of next of kin of those killed in action in the former German armed forces in Berlin. Dörfer's mother, by then a widow living in Klagenfurt, was told what had happened to her son by the Spiegel journalists in 1966. As far as I am aware, Beck and Dörfer were the last of around 23,000 people executed by the Nazi military justice system. Why were the Canadians so keen on cooperating? I'm unable to provide an answer. If you've got any suggestions, then the comment section is available. Beck's sister submitted a criminal complaint to the Cologne public prosecutor who initiated an investigation against Kern. Kern was by then a judge at the Cologne Higher Regional Court. However, the proceedings were discontinued in 1973 due to, and I quote, a lack of evidence. At the end of 1996, the Evangelical University of Applied Sciences in Hanover, the Department of Social Knowledge, suggested resuming the court-martial against Beck with the aim of an acquittal. In 1997, the public prosecutor applied for a retrial. This application was supported by the fact that Beck's Jewish ancestry justified the desertion. On the 19th of December 1997, the verdict of the court-martial was overturned by the Cologne Regional Court. Those involved in the court-martial were not prosecuted. 
In 2002, a law was passed to repeal unjust judgments in the German military criminal justice system. However, victims and their families were not compensated. I hope you found that of interest. I upload at 8 o'clock in the evening on Fridays, Central European time. And uh, when I have premieres, I try to be present so you can then interact with me if you like.